Crystal left her life on a dying earth for what she thought was a better one on another planet. What she didn't count on was becoming an exhibit in a human zoo for aliens to ogle at all day. She'll soon realize that a comfortable life trapped in a prison is infinitely worse than a difficult life on a ravaged earth surrounded by the people you love. On the planet Kepler X-47, Crystal awakes from her slumber on an ornate wooden bed with luxurious pillows and beddings. A voice from the intercom rouses her from her sleep and reminds her that she is 10 minutes late to her scheduled feeding time. A wooden armoire holds all of her fancy Marie Antoinette at Rococo-style dresses. One wall of the room displays a snowy mountain landscape, as though simulating a window. Crystal stumbles to the armoire as the voice says the others are waiting for her. Suddenly, the video on the wall changes into the sloughing off of glaciers. Beside the armoire, an antique baby bassinet holds an infant toy doll. Crystal's room is set up like those of French nobility in the 1700s, with its gaudy furniture and showy overall interior design. This is what the alien species believe to be a normal dwelling for a human being, which stems from their own understanding of Earth's anthropology. The infant doll's inclusion is to supplement the absence of possible human procreation in the facility, or the alien's poor attempt at addressing Crystal's loneliness. Later in the dining room, Crystal is joined by Marcus, Dawn, and Ray. All four are dressed in Rococo-style garb and waiting for their meal to begin. Crystal takes a sip of wine from her glass just as the intercom announces the serving of the first course, profiteroles. An alien butler removes the cloche covering the food, and Marcus picks up a handful of capsules and drops them onto his and Crystal's plates. Don picks pills one by one, and Ray waits for his turn. Then, Crystal places one capsule in her mouth and washes it down with a swig of wine. Seconds later, Marcus slides his plate over to Crystal, and she asks him what he's doing. He asks her if she doesn't want it, and she tells him that she does but is worried that he won't get to eat anything. Marcus insists that she take the capsules because he doesn't need them anymore. Delighted, Crystal says that no one else has ever had this much before slipping another capsule into her mouth. Marcus watches her ingest it, then looks down sadly. Later in her room, Crystal watches a video of flying geese as she sits on a couch next to a faceless mannequin dressed like a man. The mannequin is propped up as though it is Crystal's significant other and the toy doll in the bassinet is their child. Another of the aliens' misinformed efforts to curb Crystal's isolation. One wall of Crystal's room is made of a transparent glass-like material that shows facts about Homo sapiens in an alien language. It indicates that humans are prone to violent and self-destructive behavior and warns the spectators to keep off the glass. Moments later, an alien tour guide approaches the glass and reads the accompanying description explaining that humans find their purpose in feeding, grooming, mating, and acquiring objects out loud to three alien tourists. The aliens are humanoid bipeds with hexagonal patterns on their gray-colored skin. The tourists watch the human woman curiously as the guide continues to speak. It says that the Hecatomb nearly destroyed Earth, and on the glass screen, a video plays. The video shows a post-apocalyptic Earth, where Crystal lines up along with her boyfriend Billy and friend Lucy to apply for residency at Kepler X-47. The planet promises 10-star amenities for those that are chosen. Thousands of other hopeful humans join them in the queue, all wishing to be picked to live a better life on another planet. The dwindling resources and humanity's descent into chaos pushed Earth's few survivors to take their chances in order to survive, even if it meant heading into the unknown Kepler X-47. The tour guide explains that only the elite specimens of Earth were selected and that Crystal is their newest acquisition. Crystal notices the tour group, rolls her eyes, turns away from the glass, and pretends to fall asleep sleep. Even though she lives a comfortable life on Kepler X-47, being an exhibit in a human zoo is not what she expected when she filled out her application. The way the humans were lured to applying for the transfer made it sound like a utopia. Instead, she spends her days trapped in a room with no real freedom or happiness. Suddenly, a chiming sound plays, informing Crystal that their next meal is about to be served. She walks out of the room, and all the aliens' eyes follow her as she moves. In the dining room, Crystal, Don, and Ray sit in their proper seats. In the middle of the table is a tray holding three bowls of different colored capsules with a name card before each one. 
The three dishes for their meal include duck a l'orange, clafouti, and braised cabbage. Crystal takes one of the green capsules and holds her wine glass in her other hand. At first, the group doesn't notice Marcus is missing, but as the women turn their heads to his chair, they acknowledge his absence. By the viewing glass, the tour group that was observing Crystal now watches the three humans. Suddenly, they hear Marcus scream for help and see him on the other side of the glass being dragged by two alien sentinels. He tells Crystal to get out while she still can and to look for the light. Crystal runs to the glass to get closer to her friend just as one of the sentinels knocks Marcus out by hitting his head. Crystal helplessly watches as the man is taken away. Meanwhile, Ray tells Don that if she didn't know what the aliens did to those that disobeyed them, she knows now. Don is upset and believes that Marcus should have stayed put and kept himself from harm. Later in her room, Crystal has changed into her white nightgown and pours water from the pitcher into the basin. She washes her face in front of the mirror and wipes it dry with a washcloth. Crystal looks behind her and sees two new alien tourists behind the glass. She heads to her armoire and grabs a gold cloth which she then uses to block the tourists' view into the room. Immediately after Crystal holds up the cloth, the voice on the intercom tells her that she is hindering the visitors from accessing the exhibit. She doesn't do as the voice says and continues obstructing the tourists' view. The voice then bribes her by saying they will be serving omakase selections at lunch to get her to cooperate since it is her favorite meal. When she still disobeys the voice's orders, it threatens to suspend all of her privileges. Defeated, Crystal lowers the gold cloth and wraps it around her shoulders. She walks to the corner of her room, near the armoire, and sits on the floor. Crystal remembers the soft grass she used to lie on next to Lucy. She hears the real birds chirping as she and Lucy laugh at each other's jokes. She is eating and savoring food that isn't inside a capsule. The two friends are tearful and optimistic about their lives on Kepler X-47 if they both get chosen. But she also remembers the night she told Billy and Lucy that she's been chosen to go to Kepler X-47, while the two of them were not so lucky. The three friends cried at her impending departure and none seemed to want to say their goodbyes. Lucy tells her that she should go and not waste the opportunity. She tries to hide her sadness and pain with a smile, but Billy fails to conceal his sorrow beside her. Crystal loved her friends dearly, but the opportunity of surviving and improving her life was too difficult to pass up. Her words fail her and all she can do is walk away from the two most important people she has left in the world because she knows deep down they only want what's best for her. During the next meal, Marcus is back in his usual seat and ingests a capsule with a vacant look in his eyes. Crystal asks Marcus what he saw outside when he tried to escape, but he does not know what she's talking about. She asks if he still remembers anything and wonders what the aliens could have done to him to make him act like a shell of who he once was. Instead of answering Crystal's question, Marcus asks her if she knows what they'll be serving as the next course. Crystal is in shock at her friend's catatonic state, but all she can do is cry, afraid of what might happen to her in the future the longer she stays on the planet. Ray has a fit as he's talking to himself in nonsensical phrases. Dawn admonishes him to be quiet lest he gets them all into trouble. She then places a food capsule in her mouth and washes it down with the wine before giggling. Crystal remembers being back on Earth and spending nights in Billy's arms, laughing at the silly things and sitting in silence, just looking at each other's eyes lovingly. What Crystal wouldn't give to be back in the arms of the man she loves. She'd rather weather the hardships of a dying Earth and perish next to the people she cares about than to grow old in comfort all alone and surrounded by people who are just as disconnected from reality as she is. Later in her room, Crystal sits beside the faceless mannequin on the couch and strokes its fake white hair, just like she used to with Billy's. Moments later, Crystal notices a new tour group standing outside her exhibit. She slowly walks to the baby bassinet, lifts the infant toy doll, and holds it in her arms. All of a sudden, she lets out an angry scream and hurls the toy onto the glass, startling the spectators. Haters. The tour guide answers the aliens' questions regarding the bizarre behavior, and the guide patiently explains. Crystal notices a crack in the glass caused by her throw, and she touches it, an idea brews in her head. Later, Crystal packs her things into a bag before breaking the glass wall and making her escape. 
She finds a dark passageway she quickly runs into that will take her out of the facility. Outside, Crystal runs as fast as she can away from the facility. She lets her hair down and feels the wind on her face. Around her is a vast and flat landscape without vegetation or wildlife. All of a sudden, she stops running and drops her bag on the ground. In front of her is a seemingly infinite distance that looks impossible for her to traverse. In the sky are unknown nearby planets and billions of stars in a galaxy she is unfamiliar with. Even the light blinking in the distance that Marcus had told her to look for feels as though it is light years away teasing her with hope but never being able to reach it, no matter how hard she tries. Crestfallen, she falls to her knees and cries sorrowfully. When Crystal stands back up to her feet, she's changed back into her long white nightgown. She gives her impossible path to freedom one last melancholic look as she hears the chimes of the scheduled mealtime echo in the barren desert. Crystal turns around slowly toward the alien facility and takes small, apprehensive steps back to her prison. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.